partner in PricewaterhouseCoopers. Let me uh, just give a brief introduction to ILC. The ILC is the UK specialist think tank on the impact of longevity on society and what happens next. We believe society has to adapt now so we can all enjoy the benefits of longevity. We are one of the founding members of the ILC Global Alliance, an international network on longevity with members across 16 countries. Thank you all for joining us today. We are delighted to have you with us. And thanks also to the members of our partners program for making this webinar possible. Today, we are joined by a panel of expert actuaries, including some of our partners. The people who will be speaking are Matt Gurdon of Government Actuaries Department, Adrian Pinnington of the COVID-19 Actuaries Response Group in the UK, Douglas Anderson, representing Club Vita in the UK, Caroline Roberts, representing the Phoenix Group in the UK, and three speakers from the United States, Ed Podlowski from Morningstar Actuarial Consulting, Max Rudolph of Rudolph Financial Consulting, and Anna Rappaport, Society of Actuaries Aging and Retirement Steering Committee. Last summer, we held a discussion uh, co-hosted with the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries that took a deep dive into what the pandemic meant for financial services sectors as a result of any changes to expected mortality, life expectancy and health. One year on, we're reconvening our panel with a couple of additions to see where we are one year later. Our panelists will be sharing their insights on how has the pandemic affected the views of actuaries on future longevity, mortality and health in the UK? What has this and will this mean for financial services, including retirement income, pension schemes, annuities and the insurance industry in the UK? For the US, how changes in healthcare services and utilisation experienced during the pandemic will likely affect the US healthcare system after the pandemic. And also for the US, what has this and will this mean for financial services, including retirement income, investment, risk, healthcare, and aging? And after that, we will then also want to hear your views in the Q&A. But before we get started, a few housekeeping rules, if I may. At the bottom of your screen, you will see a chat function to communicate with panelists. And delegates, as well as a Q&A feature. This chat function uh, will be collecting questions for the panelists. In the interests of time, we would appreciate it if you could keep the questions short and focused on the topics of today's webinar. You are all invited to post comments on Twitter and uh, using uh, hashtag what happens next and at ILC UK. And finally, this webinar will be recorded and published for public access on our website and YouTube channel. Presentation slides and the recording will be published the next day. As I say, do submit your questions to our speakers using the Q&A feature in the bottom bar of your screen throughout and join the conversation on Twitter. We will be getting to the discussion after some short presentations from each of our panelists. So without further ado, let us move on to uh, the presentations. And the first presentation, uh, and in fact, the first four presentations are UK speakers. So the first presentation is from Matt Gurdon of the government, UK Government Actuaries Department. Matt is Actuarial Director for Clients Growth and Development. He is a member of GAD's Management Board and Executive, he provides management board oversight for two of the teams in the Government Actuaries Department, GAD. These are the Specialist Actuarial and the Actuarial Services Team. He also chairs the GAD Thought Leadership Oversight Group. Matt joined GAD in 2011 after working in a variety of roles in several private sector actuarial consultancies. So over to you, Matt, if you can speak on how has the pandemic affected the views of actuaries on future longevity, 
mortality and health in the UK. Over to you, Matt. Thank you, Trevor, and good afternoon, everyone. It's, it's great to be involved in this session. Uh, and I'm in the fortunate position of going first, so I don't have to worry about anybody else having already covered this ground. So as Trevor mentioned, I'm an actual director at JD, and within the department, we have been close to a variety of the activities going on within government to address the impacts of the pandemic. However, GAD works as effectively a consultancy within government, so essentially we're providing support in the areas client departments want us to, rather than driving uh, the policy and responses that are being made. So that just gives a bit of context of where GAD are. So in the few minutes I've got, I thought I'd just draw out a few thoughts on the health and economic impacts we've seen. Uh, and provide some thinking on the future outlook. Um, a bit of a spoiler alert, I don't have the answers. Hopefully, though, I can set the scene a little and frame the things we need to be thinking about. So looking first at the health impacts, two of the charts here I'm sure many of you will be familiar with uh, and you may see again coming up. Um, on the top left, we've got the ONS registered death data up to the 18th of June of this year. And this, this really highlights the significant levels of deaths in the first and second waves that we saw well above five-year average levels. But we can see recent deaths running much closer to historic averages. Um, since, since the slides were put together, these have been updated further, but the right-hand end of that chart still looks very similar. So at the bottom, we can see positive case, uh, COVID case numbers over time which is also impacted by the, the, the way testing went, to, went ahead, the, the levels of testing, and that's one of the significant factors behind the apparent low first wave case numbers relative to what we saw later in the year and coming into the, the current period. And we can see in this chart the rapid rise we're seeing at the moment with infections coming through the Delta variant. But as noted in the top chart, at the moment, the impact on deaths have been significantly more muted than we've seen earlier in the pandemic. And the hope is that the vaccination programme is, is largely responsible for that and doing its job. The top right chart here is based on ONS data and illustrates the significance of deaths across the population during 2020. And you can see in the pale bars uh, the number of people at each in each age band uh, with the darker blocks at the top, the number of deaths from all causes, not just COVID, in those age groups over 2020. Uh, the intention of showing this here is to illustrate that whilst deaths did run considerably higher than five-year averages, they were still in most age groups, a very, very small fraction of the population within, within those age groups. So thinking about that longer term impact, there's, there's clear signs there that whilst COVID's had a huge impact in the short term, longer term, there's big swathes of the population that, that may not have the same sort of effect. Within GAD, we've supported several iterations of a paper to SAGE on the level of excess deaths we may experience from the pandemic. And that's been based on scenarios produced by SPY-M for the, the SAGE group. And those scenarios that, that have been prepared for the government have provided a, a reasonable approximation of how things are building up at any particular time. But inevitably, those have to be updated and adapted as we change the rules around what people can and can't do. Um, and that affects behaviours and in turn impacts on the, the uh, rate of case uh, increase and hospitalizations and deaths. The big thing they're missing from these types of charts is the distribution within them. So these are all aggregate positions. However, we know that within certain groups of individuals, there's been much higher cases and death rates than we've seen in other groups. And there are many factors behind that, but it does indicate the importance of understanding more than just what top level figures are showing. You, we really need to dig down into some of the underlying factors. So if we go to the next slide. So moving now on to economic impacts. There's a couple of charts here that again, some of you may be familiar with. On the top right, we've got the quarter on quarter 
uh, seasonally adjusted GDP growth. And we can see the significant shock in 2020 as the economy shut down. Uh, and whilst things have rebounded, we're still trailing and we're really at risk of further shocks coming through. On the bottom left, we've got the overall impact on public sector net debt, and we can see how debt's fallen from those high levels post the world wars uh, fairly continuously to a low level around the turn of the century or a much lower level. Uh, we then had the global financial crisis, which caused a material jump in public sector net debt, which we, we hadn't really recovered from. And we've had a further jump um, in the response to COVID. And this is largely the result of the support schemes that are in place, such as the furlough scheme, the COVID loan schemes mentioned here, which, which GAD have been involved in with uh, British Business Bank, and supporting a range of uh, insurance-like support, um, such as trade credit insurance and film and TV production cover. Without those support schemes, the economic impacts could have been significantly larger than they were with even bigger impacts on public sector net debt than we've seen. We do know how that economic impacts do have knock-on impacts on health uh, and those short and long-term impacts can vary quite a lot between individuals um, and depending on the type of economic uh, impact that we experience. The lockdowns we've been through have had significant impacts on mental health for large numbers of people. And while short-term job losses have been limited, uh, we're, it's not yet clear what the medium-term outlook will be as the country unlocks, consumer behaviour alters, and there may be more challenges ahead for, for some sectors of the economy. We've also seen a lot of behavioural changes towards healthcare and delays in care support for many conditions while the pandemic was at its peak. And those changes will impact the future prospects for people across the country. And again, what we miss from these charts is, is that differential impact between the variety of sectors of the economy and the groups of the population. So ultimately, outcomes are going to look very different depending on the group that you're sat within. So what does that all mean? Um, what can we do with it? Going forwards, I think we really need to be concentrating on short, medium and long term positions and recognising the range of implications for different groups within the population and sectors of the economy. So if you think about the short term, we've got the direct COVID deaths, what they might mean for um, other short term deaths, whether they're bringing forward um, deaths that were expected in the very near term. Also, what that means uh, for, for government as an impact on services. We need to think about the vaccine and its continued effectiveness and what further variants might mean. The impact of increased government debt and the support schemes in place, which we're already seeing upticks in inflation. Uh, we, we need to consider whether they will be through, whether that will lead to higher interest rates going forwards. And in those instances, we may see more affordable annuity options coming out, better funding positions in pension schemes particularly in those that are less linked to inflation. Moving into the medium term, there's the consequence of excess deaths um, in, the, in the recent past and the support networks this leaves for those survivors. And there'll also be impacts on healthcare demands um, from long COVID survivors, uh, which at the moment, a lot of that is unknown and we're still gathering data. That long COVID is a clear issue that, that needs to be addressed. We need to consider in the medium term the impact of healthcare that's been deferred during the recent period and how much that will affect the health and well-being of the population remaining. But we may see many new approaches to healthcare which might change effectiveness. We need to think about vaccine boosters and their effectiveness and the risk of future outbreaks. And what about adaptations of the economy to new consumer demands, new ways of working, and the impact of unlocking and the removal of those support schemes that so far have, have supported um, business so effectively? And then longer term, we're likely to see more 
medical advances than perhaps we would have before. We've learned a lot of lessons through the pandemic and the speed and responsiveness of the medical professions uh, will gather a pace. We're, we're likely to see longer term behavioural changes in the way we think about health and health risks and the areas in which the economy is most likely to grow. We have to consider the risk of further pandemics in the future, uh, which may potentially be influenced by climate change. But we've also learned a lot of lessons about how to respond to those sorts of pandemics. And around the globe, uh, the populations are more aware of the risks and maybe more accepting of restrictions that might be required shorter term to control those risks. I'm sure there's going to be lots of other developments that we can't even imagine yet that will have a, a play through to ultimately what mortality and longevity will look like going forwards. So there's lots of factors there. And as I said, I don't have all the answers, but I think breaking it down to think of short, medium, longer term and the particular sectors that you're interested in is, is the way that we need to consider this. And it needs to be relevant to the particular situation of concern for you, which will be different for a pension scheme versus an insurer versus the government. But I think we can use that to shape our future thinking and what we want to do when we start reflecting long-term expectations. So that's all I was gonna say. I will now pass back to Trevor. Thank you very much, Matt. What a wonderful, insightful, sweeping view of everything that's uh, to be looked at and considered. Um, and I hope we'll get some questions, um, which perhaps ask you to drill into a bit more detail of what you've been doing uh, for government. But let's see what comes through. So thanks ever so much, Matt. That's been really useful as a fantastic introduction. I'd now, under the same heading of um, how the pandemic has affected the views of actuaries. Um, I'd like to introduce Adrian Pinnington, uh, representing the COVID-19 Actuaries Response Group here in the UK. Um, Adrian is an actuary and director of TSAP Consulting, which provides support to the life assurance sector. And he is also on this uh, COVID-19 Actuaries uh, Response Group. His career includes direct insurance, reinsurance and consultancy. TSAP has a particular focus on database applications needed for mortality, morbidity and longevity. He is a regular contributor and speaker at industry forums, helping decision makers to understand the narrative that data is revealing so that better informed decisions are made. Um, the actuary's response group has been incredibly um, influential in um, affecting the, the uh, views of so many important groups in the country and um, so I'm really looking forward to what Adrian has to say and that the sorts of work he and uh, the re response group have been doing. Over to you Adrian. Thank you very much Trevor. Um, yeah, just if we have the next slide. And whilst it's up, I'll just talk a little bit. Um, firstly, um, I'm sure everybody does understand that I'm filling in for Nicola, um, who, who who was indisposed for today, but she's fine. She's in good order. But uh, I've had fairly short notice to put some things together. So one of the things that Nicola would have brought would be in a public health um, expert view and, and commentary from that side of things. I'm a mere actuary, so I'm just going to try to bring together what we're seeing from the actuary's response group. There are a few things that are that we are seeing as worthwhile explaining about the formation of the actuaries response group, um, because they seem to be in. They see it seems to provide something that may be of good influence, influence and potentially copyable in other areas. So you could read that information there, but uh, I will say to you that it started back in March of 2020, very early. The it was driven by the. Uh, then Tan Su Che, who was the upcoming uh, president-elect for the Institute of Actuaries. And he foresaw, with, along with a few other individuals, that actually in a time of rapid change and crisis, uh, messages can become very garbled. And so the aspiration was that a group could be formed uh, that would comprise a reasonable mix of skills, medical, epidemiological, um, and public health that could provide insights and understand 
material that was being presented from those who were dealing with the crisis at the very front line. Um, the lots of papers soon started to be produced. Lots of activity started coming out uh, on the internet in various forums, some of which was giving narratives which were extremely damaging and others which were trying to focus on a narrative that's reliable. Our group was intending to try to take the very technical documentation that becoming, was becoming available and provide a narrative that would be reliable and a good central line. Interestingly, it was set up outside of the auspices of the Institute of Actuaries. Um, there was a comment, and I think a few people may smile at this one, that if we'd waited for the professional body to actually agree the formation of such a group, it would have taken six months just to agree the original terms of reference. Um, so we started independently, we remain that way, we're completely voluntary. The R in ARG importantly stands for response, it's not research, so it's the actual response group, and it is about taking data that we've seen and getting out a, a, an explanation of that or driving a way that, which that can be understood, which would be helpful to the um, the universal effort to try to combat this crisis that we've been facing. So uh, the focus was on a quick best endeavor with bulletins and on topical matters. We've now produced in excess of 130 or 140 bulletins, and uh, most of you have probably found our website. But it's also, I can go on to the next slide. Thank you. Um, the way the activity has worked has proved quite interesting and, and informative. Um, we started out with a LinkedIn account um, because we felt that the, initially the communications were going to be largely to uh, other professionals who would be interested in what actuaries might be seeing from the data that was emerging. But we soon started to grow out from that. Um, we found that a web page, uh, which we now have available to us, was better for storing documentation that we that we've already written on and for referring back if people wanted to access them it was proving much easier to do that. Um, the web page divides things up into bulletins which are uh, a fairly single topic to look into a paper or a few papers that have been produced on a particular matter. Um, the SPI-M which is the, um, the, 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 the modeling group that's talked about the pandemics you know, for influenza modeling group that's been mentioned today uh, is, is one such area where we would look into that paper, try to distill the, the, the fairly thick technical matters, and then present the conclusions in a way that most uh, decision makers could find easier to comprehend. We've got weekly and bi weekly now Friday reports. These cover a very wide range of top topics that are, are, are of interest or have been of interest during the, the week or two weeks leading up to that. Much shorter, just a, a general introduction and general commentary about them. And then blogs, which are a quick response to an issue which is getting attention from day to day. We also have a Twitter group. Um, there's a, a group that is part of the Actuaries Response Group, and then several of its members have personal accounts as well. Twitter proves to be very influential, far more influential than, than I'd begun or certainly would have expected at the very beginning of this. I, I would have said I was quite dismissive of Twitter. But if you want to really get input from others who may well be experts in any particular field of, of uh, this pandemic, uh, the Twitter sphere seems to be the place to go to. And it's quite often the case that members of our panel will be involved in several hours of live chat with uh, people who are just asking questions from all over the world. So uh, in terms of getting answers to things, um, I think that's something that we should be pursuing a little bit more. Certainly they're current topics and certainly they get quite lively. And inevitably they also get trolls, which is I think something we have to live with. We did try with Facebook, but it didn't work. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't getting anywhere near the kind of attention as the other pages, the other social media methodologies. So there's this sort of a, a bit of a, a, a suggestion for people as a takeaway that uh, might be helpful because we do have to try and collaborate with each other. So next slide please. So my intention here is to just give you uh, a very quick run through of no more than two or three 
issues of the literally um, several hundred topics that have now been discussed uh, and touched on in the actuary's response group. This is a quick overview of the UK. You've seen the top slide. Um, I've then tried to line up underneath it the deaths and the hospitalizations. Um, the most important thing to note is that on deaths, it's even though we have had a very steep increase in new infections, um, rapidly approaching the peak of the second wave, which we can see was multiple times the peak of the first wave, which caused so much consternation. And we can see that the deaths um, were, although down, uh, clearly they were, they, they, they're lower than the, um, uh, on the, the, the second wave peak of deaths, is not as severe as the peak of deaths from the first wave. And I say that because you can see that if you just look at the amplitudes, the first wave amplitude deaths were a multiple of the amplitude of cases. In the second wave, comparatively, deaths are pretty similar in amplitude to the cases. So th th this is not to say that they, there weren't a lot of deaths, there were indeed. But with the third wave that's coming, we can see that link has been broken. If we look down to hospitalizations, we see likewise that the amplitude of the uh, peaks from first to second waves uh, paralleled the cases, but not in the third wave that we are now beginning to see. We desperately hope that that is something that will continue. And the reason for it, we would say, has to be highly correlated with the successful vaccination that we've managed to achieve in the UK. But if there's one message you take from this, it has to be that vaccinations do seem to produce some beneficial outcome, at least, in, at, least at this stage of the pandemic. So the, the numbers of vaccinations, the proportion of adult population and vaccinated is the top right hand side being sh shown on that checkered board. Okay, so if we move on to the next slide, that's one topic. This is another topic that we've been talking about recently in, in our group. And that is to look at the how the models have been doing. So we've taken here the Warwick model, um, Warwick uh, Imperial College, the um, uh, School for uh, Tropical Medicines and Health, Health and Tropical Medicines have also produced um, uh, models as have the SPI-M group. There are several of them uh, feeding into SAGE, which is the government advisory group on these matters, technical and modeling. Now, when they first produced these kinds of charts, which were designed to look at the implications of relaxing um, infection control measures throughout the country, allowing people to mix more, um, making it legal to not wear a mask again, the kinds of projections that were being produced focused on a relaxation date of the 21st of June. And depending on the information you put into your model, you vary your parameters, you get different outcomes. So the gray that you can see was one of them. The brownish one was um, uh, reopening on the 19th of July at that point. So this is old projections. What we can now see, and this has become an interesting topic of discussion, is the actual hospitalizations that were emerging, which is the blue dotted line. Earlier this week, and, and over the, in fact, over the last week and a half, um, new modeling has started to become, become available. And we now see the dark black line, which is a projection from Warwick of what they would see hospitalizations are likely to be. So seeing how well the experts are producing models, which are, which are informing government responses is clearly, clearly critical to us. If the models are right, then that will have implications for us as actuaries and people responsible for the management of life officers. If the epidemic takes off again, we see more hospitalizations and more deaths, it's a direct, direct effect. So knowing whether we can or cannot relax the infection control measures is important. So this was a, an interesting area of discussion, but. What is most fascinating is that the experts were gathering new information in the last four weeks, and when they produced their latest models, they've been able to tone down the expected 
hospitalizations and probably also deaths. So next slide. And the reason for this, well, um, this is again, just to keep people informed, you can see what's happened. And this, this, uh, this shows you the proportions of people in various age groups. So at the beginning of uh, the epidemic, most of the people ending up in hospital were certainly uh, 65 plus. So that's the blue band up to the end of the gray band. Um, and in, in, you know, if you just go down a little bit, if you took from 55 age group up, it was more than 75% of those ending up in hospital were over age, 50, over age 55. Now, uh, we would say largely because of the uh, in, uh, vaccinations, the numbers of people, or the age groups of people finding themselves in hospital is, is a smaller number and proportionately more of them are younger. The 25 to 44 age group, which is the yellow block, is seen as being dominant. And that is the age group in which we are still rolling out first and second uh, vaccinations. So this again is, a, is, an, is, an, is something that we would discuss uh, in the Actuaries Response Group in our open forums um, with an intention of sharing, educating, and influencing. So next slide, please. Um, and then finally, um, just to show you what we're trying to do, we respond quickly rather than being too concerned about being accurate. Uh, these papers were released on the 12th uh, Monday, and there is already a document out from the Actors Response Group uh, on our website yesterday, distilling this fairly dense uh, information. So the Actors Response Group is trying to do those kind of things. We want to try to get answers. It, probably is best to try and engage with us on one of those forums. Um, so I think from me, that that's it. Back to Trevor, thank you. Thank you very much, Adrian. It's great to see all the initiatives you're taking in terms of your responses, the whole uh, areas that you're covering. And uh, I would thoroughly encourage anyone to try and join in on those discussions that you're referring to. So thank you ever so much. And at such short notice, Adrian, for stepping in. That's wonderful. We're moving on now. Um, the next question in the UK is, what has this and will this mean for financial services, including retirement income, pension schemes, annuities, and the insurance industry? And to kick this off, I'm delighted to have uh, as our next speaker, Caroline Roberts of the Phoenix Group. Caroline is the mm -hmm. longevity risk manager um, of the Phoenix Group, which is the largest specialist consolidator of life assurance and pension funds in Europe with businesses in the UK, Germany and Ireland. With over 10 years of experience in longevity models and assumptions, she is the leading longevity expert within the Phoenix Group and in recent years has played a major part in the development of their internal model longevity assumptions. So I'm sure we're going to um, have lots of interesting uh, thoughts on annuities and everything else around uh, the financial services response to what is going on. So uh, Caroline, looking forward to hearing from you. Over to you. Thank you very much. So I'd like to start by thanking the ILC for inviting me back to talk to you again one year further into the COVID-19 pandemic. So if we can move on to the first slide, please. And the next slide, sorry. <laughs> okay, so when I spoke in June last year, um, my theme was that of uncertainty. There we were talking about a pandemic that had only officially been going on for three months after the WHO officially declared it was a pandemic on the 11th of March. And then in the UK, we started our first lockdown on the 23rd of March. So when I spoke in June, there was still a lot of uncertainty about what it would mean for my area of work, which is predicting life expectancy, and indeed for the insurance industry as a whole. So what has the pandemic meant for the UK life insurance industry so far? So as Trevor said, I work for the Phoenix Group, which is the UK's largest long-term savings and retirement business. And one of the largest risks that we face is longevity risk due to our large portfolio of annuitants. And this time last year, 
many analysts were thinking that the pandemic would lead to a release of reserves as we see the impact of the increase in deaths. So whilst at Phoenix, we have seen um, higher deaths than we otherwise would, would expect to see over this period, um, the, actual impact, the actual impact of the experience was relatively small when you kind of compare it to population. And that reflects the higher socio-demographic profile of our annuity policyholders, which as we now know, has seen lower death rates throughout the pandemic. So actually the much bigger threat to life insurance companies has come from market volatility. And in particular, the risk of downgrades and defaults in the liquid and illiquid credit portfolios that we hold to back our annuity book of business. Therefore, insurance companies are needed to take a proactive approach to manage credit portfolios. And in all honesty, in many ways, the biggest challenge arising from the pandemic was getting our 7,000 colleagues to work from home. At Phoenix, we did this within 10 days of the first lockdown being announced, without any interruption to our customer service and ensuring that we kept our phone lines for customers open throughout. So this new way of working is potentially one of the biggest impacts on the UK life insurance industry so far. And it'll be interesting to see how these future ways of working may change in the future. I myself have worked successfully from home for over six years. So maybe rather than me being a bit of an oddity, this may become much more common. I kind of hope so, to be honest. So what about the uncertainty that I spoke of last year in relation to actuarial models? and how we're going to predict the impact that the pandemic will have on future life expectancy. So if could go on to the next slide, please. So to help picture the problem, I'll start with the slide that I showed last year. And this shows the historical mortality rates from 2000 to 2019. As this slide shows, mortality rates have been declining steadily for a long time. Although since 2011, this rate of decline has slowed. In fact, improvements in the last decade are actually the lowest in the last 70 years, but that's a whole different topic. So up until now, we've been, very, we've been able to very nearly draw a line through the experience, although there are two distinct periods before and after 2011. This has meant it's been a relatively easy job to fit a model through the historical data and then kind of like project that forward and kind of say, okay, well, this is the trend line. So this is how we think, what's going, this is how we predict what might happen in the future. But what happens when we add 2020 to this chart? The next slide, please. So as you'd expect, when you add in 2020, we have a point that doesn't fit neatly along the trend line. So the question is what will happen next? Will mortality rates go back to that lighter grey line that goes through the 2011 to 2019 experience? Or is there going to be a new trend line starting from 2020? So previously it was OK to predict the future based on the patterns and trends from what has happened in the past. And up until now, that hasn't been a bad assumption, although it did take us a while to accept that the change in the rate of improvements from 2011 was a new trend rather than just a blip. But due to this pandemic, we now have a clear discontinuity. So can we continue to use our current models? And this is one of the practical challenges that life insurers face. And I've shown you longevity assumptions because that's what I look at, but it isn't just in relation to longevity. For all demographic and market assumptions, we saw disruption as a result of 2020. And so for all these assumptions, life insurers need to decide how to treat 2020. The next slide, please. So is it a one-off event? So can we ignore it altogether for the purpose of setting, reserving and pricing assumptions? Or does it put it on, a, on us on a different trajectory? When I say that, so I mean, we had a nice straight line, but are we looking at a different shape completely or just a different slope? Or are there much longer term consequences, which means that our view of the future is completely different? And we spoke kind of like, there's still so much uncertainty about what will happen. So, for example, with longevity going forwards, there may be positive impacts. So we actually see less death rates as we see potentially um, we see um, some of the, um, the increased vaccine take up. Um, so any medical advances that have happened in the last year could um, work on re reducing deaths in the future. 
or will we see increased deaths in the future um, as a result of delayed diagnoses uh, and, and other, uh, other kind of things that may have, have a more negative impact? So while the obvious answer might be to simply exclude 2020 from any data analysis, and I would suggest probably 2021 as well, this, actual, this period does actually give us some valuable information. It can show us what volatility can do, and it also shows the contagion that can take place between completely different assumptions. While a pandemic was always going to clearly impact the assumptions on mortality rates, we now have evidence as to how market assumptions are also impacted. So we need to learn from this data and not just remove it. And next slide, please. So yes, there is a lot of uncertainty in the future. And this is where the life insurance industry should have some opportunities. For example, estimating future life expectancy is going to be challenging as I've explained. And insurers for a while have been using scenario-based models that look at future potential causes of death rather than relying on those historical patterns and just projecting them forwards. Therefore, many non-life insurance companies who perhaps don't have these more sophisticated models will have less appetite to manage the risks associated with their own um, DB pension schemes. So life insurers may be best placed to take on this risk through bulk annuity transfers. And the pandemic can also act as a trigger point for the UK to reconsider its approach to long-term savings and an opportunity for the industry to reinvent itself the pandemic hasn't changed the fact that people are on average living longer lives. Now, many headline, newspaper headlines have talked about the large fall in life expectancy as a result of the pandemic, but these headlines don't tell the full story. Yes, mortality rates increased for 2020, but we don't expect that to, to continue. And going forwards, we will continue to see medical advances and societal changes that will mean people will live for longer. And someone who's retiring at 65 in five years' time will on average live longer than someone who is retiring today. So as people are spending longer in retirement, it is important that they understand the financial implications of this. And the life insurance industry can help by ensuring that people understand this and offer appropriate products to support it. And as people's working lives are extending, we will be seeing people having multiple careers and potentially retraining to follow a completely different career path. So we need to ensure that life insurance products and pension saving plans are flexible enough to support this. And something else that became sadly clear during the pandemic are the issues faced by the social care sector. Although substantial investment needs to be made into social care, as it stands, the UK government hasn't committed the funds required. So this is another potential area where appropriate products offered by the insurance industry could assist with funding gaps. And finally, as we've seen from the excellent work that has been carried out by the COVID-19 Actuaries Response Group, this is an area where actuaries and life insurance companies have the knowledge and the expertise. This is the analysis that we excel in. We are used to um, looking at these deaths. I mean, it feels that at the moment you go, on, um, you go online and you, you look at Twitter, you listen to the news and everyone now has an opinion about kind of like models and what's going to happen to future deaths. And that is kind of what actually is that's what we've been looking at for years. I am finding I now have to explain a lot less what I do because um, everyone now understands the importance of our work. So here is a real opportunity for us to help share this knowledge and our data. And um, that's all I had to say. So um, pass back to you. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you ever so much, Caroline. Um, I think it was great the way that you um, put just as much uh, stress on uh, markets as you did on the demographics in terms of the impact on insurance companies so that uh, the listeners to this uh, webinar can get um, a balanced view of everything that's happening. And I also uh, thought it was great that you were looking forward as to what the roles of the insurance companies and sectors are. Um, and I know that when we get onto our US speakers, I think they're also going to get into some of that discussion. So I'm hoping we can have an interest, um, an interesting compare, <coughs> compare and contrast. Right, thanks for that very much, uh, Caroline. Now moving on to our final UK speaker, who also uh, spoke last time, uh, last summer. Uh, and I'm delighted to welcome Douglas Anderson of Club Vita. Douglas is the founder of Club Vita, 
uh, which specializes in applying model, modern data science techniques to innovate in longevity and mortality risk management. Before specializing in data science, Douglas practiced for 30 years as a consulting actuary across a diverse spectrum of engagements. He is a fellow of both the UK's Institute of Actuaries and the US's Society of Actuaries and a chartered enterprise risk actuary. And I think it's great that uh, we've got Douglas here who has specialized in data science. Uh, my own view is that the more actuaries specialize in data science, uh, the better for society and uh, for the actuaries. Um, and also uh, work together with um, one, of, one of my other hats is I'm a, I chair the um, Audit and Risk Committee at the Royal Society of Stat uh, Statistics, where they're heavily into data science as well. So I'm going to be fascinated to see what Douglas brings to the table um, from a very useful background. So over to you, Douglas. Uh, thank you very much, Trevor. And uh, yeah, thank you for that wonderful build up. Um, I all started incidentally with uh, 10 years of grounding and working in the government actuaries department. I think this is the first time that I've had uh, two other uh, GAD colleagues of, of different generations uh, on the same platform. So um, I'd like to try and build on some of the themes, if I may, that Caroline opened up though, in terms of the, uh, the financial services industry in the UK. Um, as you may be aware, I have a kind of one foot in the UK and one foot in, 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 in the United States and Canada as well, if that's metaphorically possible. And I'd like to try and uh, also kind of explain uh, some of the, 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 the transatlantic uh, risk transfer market and how, how that's operating now. So if you wouldn't mind moving on to the next slide, please. Um, and the next one, please. So just in terms of kind of, uh, uh, what what is the market in the UK in terms of uh, for insurance companies? Uh, Caroline uh, mentioned the pension risk transfer market. That's the the transference of of uh, defined benefit pension liabilities from the corporate balance sheet onto the insurance balance sheet. Uh, there's been a vibrant uh, market for the last fifteen years or so in the in the UK. Um, under which private sector pension plans have been decommissioning, de-risking, and then decommissioning their pension their pension plans. And I guess the first observation is to note that that, that market kind of um, continued pretty much unaffected by the uh, the COVID uh, disruption of last year. So there's no there was no uh, marked discontinuity in pricing. There wasn't like a an emergence of a different view on what the appropriate price was for the cedent of the risk and the risk taker here. Uh, nor was there any great disruption to the uh, the business operation, as Caroline said. Most people moved very effectively online within a very uh, short period of time. There may have been a little bit of disruption to the um, to the, the business origination, the kind of the the, the sales of the, of these may have been delayed a bit, and a, a little uh, bit of uh, additional benefit actually from the credit markets, where kind of almost the opposite side of the coin to what Caroline was referring to, from the decommissioning kind of uh, corporate perspective, they're kind of thinking that the that the increase in yields in the short term that they saw was actually an opportunity to complete a transaction that otherwise might have been unaffordable from their perspective. So, so the that 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 link between the the the, the kind of the the thinking together uh, of the financial risks and the longevity risk, I think, is very important. And one other kind of thing to pull out here is the the yellow uh, bits of these of, of this bar chart here relates to longevity swap transactions. So that's pure um, pure longevity insurance taking place as opposed to transferring the financial obligations of the pension plan onto insurance companies. And you can see there, there was quite a lot of activity, twenty four billion pounds worth of longevity swaps. Principally from financial service, principally from the pension funds of, of financial services organisations, uh, transferring the risk, the uncertainty of future movements in longevity to the insurance market. Uh, and so it's it's interesting that despite um, despite if you could click on the next one, despite Caroline's point about about the, there being a perception that uh, longevity improvements have stalled. A growing perception since that kind of point of inflection in 2011, you still see 
a lot of interest in the in, in longevity tra risk transfer taking place. And that's maybe two reasons for that. One is that the national population figure is, disguises what's going on on a socioeconomic basis, and you probably see much stronger improvements taking place in higher socioeconomic groups. And the second reason is looking forward, uh, there's an awful lot of uncertainty still as to what's going to happen in the future. And a theme I want to pick up on the next slide. So if you could click on, please, Lily. Yes, that's just highlighting that yellow bit there at the top. Click on again. And uh, I mentioned it's like it's been like a decade or 15, probably even 15 years now since since pension fund de-risking really got going in earnest. It really started in the UK with the mark to marking on the corporate balance sheet of uh, defined benefit pension liabilities, which started in the early 2000s. And uh, since then, the this top chart shows the the switch in the in the the average pension funds. Uh, investment allocation, which you can see has moved from 60% uh, equities to just 20% equities today, uh, and a corresponding increase in bonds. So a really dramatic shift over that period in terms of the financial de-risking. But one of the interesting consequences of that, if you click on again, is that longevity uh, is now the biggest residual risk of the pension plans. And there are you know, something like two trillion dollars, two trillion pounds worth of of uh, of of uh, pension liabilities sitting on the corporate balance sheet in the UK, with now fifty percent of the uncertainty relating to what happens next in longevity. So longevity becomes a, a, an interesting uh, a, an interesting subject, and as Caroline said, one of the one of the uh, interesting consequences, and, and indeed is helped along by things like the the actuaries COVID response uh, team, has been a, the creation of a whole you know massive armchair epidemiologists and, and armchair actuaries who are suddenly desperately interested in all this all this modelling stuff that's going on. So from a from a, a pension fund awareness perspective. This is, is terrific, a terrific market in, now in order to uh, get people to develop uh, much more risk managed financial institutions. So if you could move on again. Um, and again, picking up a, a theme of the previous three speakers is really just the, the what happens next in terms of the uncertainty. And uh, Caroline mentioned uh, the use of scenario model scenario based approaches to modeling this is a this is an example of it uh, some work that my colleagues at club vita have done and what we're showing here is is four different simulations of what could happen to period life expectancy in future depending upon uh, whether the positives outweigh the negatives, should we say, um, in terms of, you know, we've heard a, a whole list of different positive and negative fa factors, like on the negative side, things like um, cancer uh, treatments being delayed, unfortunately, because of a lack of hospital capacity in the UK versus on the positive side, the opportunity to be in more control of your time if, if the, uh, tr the uh, adoption of working from home uh, becomes a permanent thing and uh, that is the potential to give people the opportunity for more exercise um, for example so so if depending upon your views on whether those things are positive or negative and how future governments decide to spend public expenditure this is the sort of range of uncertainty that we come up with you can notice though however in all cases that we do anticipate a very v-shaped recovery if you like in in period life expectancy that we expect it to dip down and recover quite sharply like gdp um, and uh so uh, if you anybody's interested in understanding what we did to produce the model the link is at the bottom and i believe the slides will be shared afterwards but I guess the overriding a message here is one of, of probably increased uncertainty as a consequence of the behavioural change that we've seen uh, taking place. And, and this is perhaps one of the biggest differences compared to the financial crisis of 2007, 2008, is, it, is that this financial, this crisis is all about behavioural change for me, rather than being kind of financial distress. Uh, We've, the, the governments uh, have gone out of their way to kind of protect people from financial distress. And, and, but what we're seeing is really a kind of an acceleration of behavioural change taking place on the, 
on a personal level. So clicking on again, please, Lily. And if, if uh, to just to kind of illustrate one of the things, and this is not directly related to COVID, this, was, this, this, this thing was going on, but it's probably got more impetus as a consequence of COVID, is that um, we're seeing uh, this is a, a UK-based campaign to try to increase uh, healthy life expectancy. It's just the business world getting together. Uh, uh, an organization called Business for Health uh, with a, uh, is trying to kind of get an initiative going in which health becomes part of the growing ethical investment world of um, environmental, social and governance type thinking about trying to enforce, uh, encourage uh, nudging uh, corporates into better behaviours, um, not just in, in, in environmental things like climate change and, and social and governance related issues, but now in, in terms of health and, and specifically trying to encourage what is a really ambitious target of trying to add five years to healthy life expectancy. They also have a, an aim here of trying to tighten the longevity inequality, that is the, the difference in life expectancy between high and low socioeconomic groups. I find this fascinating. It's something that personally I, I, I want to uh, invest some time in trying to help make happen. Uh, uh, and uh, I'm particularly intrigued by this, uh, the, the behavioral nudge kind of thing going on with trying to get uh, the H into ESG. So it becomes ESHG and, it, and trying to get this into the ethical world and then trying to change investment behaviors by by you know creating um, creating investment funds that screen out people companies that whose services aren't particularly well aligned to encouraging healthier behaviors and it, and just today we've seen a, a a publication in the uk about about taxing sugar and salt uh, and then a government initiative where and it appeared it, it, um, Prime Minister Johnson was asked to comment on this this morning and kind of, and kind of, I think his, his kind of off the cuff reaction was, I don't like extra tax. Uh, so it, it could be, it could be that, that it's again up to business to rather, just rather like in climate change, it's up to business to kind of come up with the solution here as the, as the government uh, decide to sit on the fence and just wait and see what happens. If you want again. And my kind of my own kind of pet area, just to, again, not directly related to COVID, but I thought you might, uh, some participants may be interested, that whilst the COVID thing has been going on, um, there's been an increase in the amount of transatlantic trading of longevity, UK longevity being hedged off against largely against US mortality risk. Um, Back when I when I started thinking about setting up Club Vita in the United States, uh, there was just one insurance company who was taking UK longevity risk. Uh, there are now five different insurance groups in the United States, um, there, and and many more elsewhere in the world. I, sh I should emphasize, to, lest anybody get uh, uh, um, feel left out. But it's interesting that there's been there's there's been at least a net for increase in additional insurance companies coming from who are, who are on US soil taking UK based longevity risk, partially motivated at least by a desire to try to hedge it off against US mortality risk. Uh, happily uh, discuss that under questioning later. It could be organized better. You'll see I've got three different colors in here for, for different groups of people. Uh, these, these are intended to represent different socioeconomic groups. We would get a much more efficient transatlantic trading or indeed global trading. It doesn't just need to be between the UK and the United States here. Uh, if we can move on again, if you could organize these into three uh, or three or more uh, more homogeneous groups, because you see such significant socioeconomic separation in, in life expectancy according to, according to socioeconomic group, then to make it an, a more efficient market, you really ought to organize it uh, to put people in different sub buckets. That would also have the benefit if we did that of being more likely to engage a wider trading of longevity in the capital markets because it would encourage more liquidity of secondary transactions to take place 
um, and, inc and encourage the, the capital markets to, 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 um, uh, uh, to be more willing to take on longer duration risk. Anyway, a few themes here, which are things which are going on in the background whilst, uh, whilst everybody's been thinking about COVID. There's been a lot of other stuff going on in, in the market of, uh, for of the financial markets for trading longevity and happy to take any questions on that area as well later on. That's, that's me. Back to you, Trevor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Douglas. And I, I love the way you expanded into the things which are in development at the moment. Uh, sort of bubbling under the surface, which are going to just become more important. And we must always look at uh, what's going on with COVID in the context of other trends. So thank you very much for that. Well, uh, a little step change now. Um, we're going to start the US part of uh, this webinar with the healthcare questions. How will changes in healthcare services and utilization experienced during the pandemic likely affect the US healthcare system after the pandemic. And uh, to talk us through this area will be Ed Podlowski, who's Morningstar Actuarial Consulting. Ed has more than 35 years of healthcare actuarial experience consulting with large Fortune 500 companies. He is an associate of the Society of Actuaries, a member of the American Academy of Actuaries and a fellow of the Conference of Consulting Actuaries. Ed was the 2019 president of the CCA, the Conference of Consulting Actuaries, and chairs its healthcare community. He also serves as a board member of the health section of the International Actuarial Association, the IAA. So who better to take us through um, all that's going on in the US with regard to healthcare than Ed? Over to you, Ed. Thank you, Trevor, and uh, thanks to the ILC for inviting me back again. Uh, Morningstar works specifically in the healthcare actuarial field and works a lot with plan sponsors, health plans, and, and those who work tangentially with them. So today I plan to cover what can be expected to occur within the U.S. healthcare system in the wake of the, the COVID-19 pandemic, including at the end of projection of cost effect on the system. Uh, now, to be clear, we're still in the midst of pandemic, so any resurgence in the spread of the virus may influence how patients and providers will ultimately react, uh, but this presentation should give you some guidance to what we might expect in the next 18 to 24 months. There's a lot of information behind the slides I'm gonna share um, out of respect for my fellow speakers and the time that we have today, I'm gonna just go through some high level. So, if you do have uh, further questions that, that either aren't addressed during this presentation or just wanna reach out to me, I've left my contact information available to all of you for that. If you can move to the next slide, <coughs> actually the next slide, there you go. So this graph gives a quick view of the confirmed case counts in the US over the past 18 months. And uh, as of yesterday, we've had over uh, 34.8 million cases and over 623,000 deaths in the U.S. That leads all countries in both those categories, although our, our 330 million population, um, and when you put that on a per capita basis, uh, doesn't rank us in the top. But obviously that gives us a significant amount of information uh, around the pandemic for us to draw from as, as we try to reach some of these conclusions. Next slide. So numerous sources, including Strata Decision Technology, the Commonwealth Fund, the Kaiser Family Foundation, the Healthcare Cost Institute, and even the US federal government, show a clear pattern of declining access to the US healthcare system during the pandemic as a result of the desire for, for social isolation early in, in the pandemic. Um, initial signs right now of healthcare utilization in, in May of June of 2021 suggest that we may be starting to return back to pre-pandemic levels. However, some care that was foregone last year and early part of this year, like annual physicals and screenings, um, will, will be foregone uh, and, and we won't see those come back, but there will be other care deferred until 2021 or later, like elective surgeries and some of those non-cyclical screenings like breast, breast cancer screenings and uh, I should say non-annual screenings like breast cancer screenings and, and uh, colon, uh, colonoscopies, colonoscopy screenings. Deferred demand will therefore begin to put pressure on the healthcare system in late 2021 and into 22, limited by obviously the capacity of providers to handle any such surge in, in the uh, uh, requested care. And in fact, uh, just yesterday I saw 
a study by the Journal of the American Medical Association would show that uh, they're predicting a surge in pregnancies this summer. So we may be in the midst of our, our post COVID uh, baby boom. Next slide. Uh, this graph shows the increased usage of telemedicine during the pandemic. Um, health, I'm sorry, Fair Health is reporting most recently, those numbers continue to decline to about 5.6 and 4.9 for March and April 2021, respectively. The central issue with telemedicine um, to, it is really the overall impact on the cost of care. Uh, and it will be, you know, how well um, telehealth is reimbursed as compared to, say, in office visits. There's certainly a lot of data that shows that telehealth can avoid costly visits in other settings like the emergency room and potentially even in, in the physician office. But overuse along with reimbursements at or close to in-office visits could erode any of those savings and potentially create a more costly component in an already expensive U.S. healthcare system. Uh, so acceptance of this, I, I think, will, um, and, and a progression of this, I think, will require some close attention going forward. Next slide. Uh, there's been a, a significant impact on the mental health condition of, of the U.S. population. As of May 6th through June 7th, the U.S. Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, their pulse survey showed that the share of, of adults reporting systems of anxiety or depression uh, at about 29.5%. And that's on top of the American uh, Psychiatric Association poll conducted last year. Uh, that reported that 62 Americans feel more anxious than they did in 2019. Um, that marks a sizable, uh, sizable increase over prior polls by the APA, which uh, over the past three years ranged anywhere from 32 to 39 percent. Additionally, we've had over 600,000 deaths, as I reported earlier, um, due to COVID-19, and, and researchers estimate that more than 5 million Americans are in mourning, including more than 43,000 children who have lost a parent. You know, the scale and complexity of pandemic-related grief have created a, a really a public health burden that could deplete Americans' physical and mental health for years. Uh, so the rise of mental health conditions that we saw late last year and, and moving into this year, I, I think, are going to have significant impacts on the healthcare system. Next slide. Uh, there's been a, a significant impact on behavioral health as well as a result of the pandemic. There's been more than a dozen of studies that have found that 20 to 40 percent of individuals surveyed reported consuming more alcohol than usual during the pandemic. Um, a recent survey of about 3,000 U.S. adults by the American Psychological Association found that 42 percent of respondents reported unders undesired weight gain of about 29 pounds, which I think translates to about 13 kilograms for those of you in the, in the UK. It, it also found that 18% of the respondents lost weight, um, but, but only uh, about 26 pounds or maybe about 10 uh, or 11 or, or, or 12 kilograms if I'm doing the conversion rate. Right. Uh, there are also studies that show that, that drivers take more risks. In, in fact, um, in, in the state of Ohio, uh, they looked at uh, 2019 versus 2020 in the first six months and showed that while traffic volume dropped 26% after um, the state of emergency declaration was declared, declared motor vehicle related, uh, either fatal or severe injuries declined only, only just less than 12%. So uh, people were taking more risks on, on highways because perhaps they could drive faster, et cetera. So these pandemic induced behavioral health issues are likely to create um, you know, healthcare issues that are going to need to be addressed in 2021 and beyond. Next slide, please. Uh, you know, in the U.S., six in 10 adults have chronic diseases, four in 10 have two or more, um, you know, issues like uh, heart disease, cancer, chronic lung disease, stroke, Alzheimer's, diabetes, etc. cetera. Uh, nearly 10 million uh, breast, colorectal, and prostate cancer screenings were missed last year. Uh, it really, the impact I think is going to be on, on the lack of chronic condition management and what that will mean going forward. Uh, the increased level of care required to treat these unmanaged conditions will likely be a part of increased utilization and cost of services in, in 2021 and beyond. Next slide. Uh, this graph displays the percent of COVID-19 patients with continuing health issues by status of their condition under COVID-19 when they were first diagnosed. 
post-COVID conditions are really defined as any condition that persists 30 days or more after initial diagnosis. And the study of adults in Switzerland who had contracted COVID-19 found that a quarter of them still had symptoms for six to eight months following their illness. So long-haul COVID appears in patients uh, that have recovered from the virus, but continue to exhibit, exhibit symptoms for weeks or potentially even months. And there are an array of symptoms that fall under that, uh, including continued loss of taste and smell, long-term fatigue, hair loss, migraine, sensitivity to light, shortness of breath, rapid heart rate, nausea, low oxygen levels, random bruising, weight loss, brain swelling, liver cysts, brain fog, and, and the list goes on and on. And right now, the cause of these conditions remain unknown, and there's a lot of research going on into some of the neurological effects of COVID-19. So the central issue here will be how long will they need treatment? What side effects will be permanent? Will the permanent side effects need continuing care? Um, additional studies are gonna be needed to answer a lot of these questions, but hopefully those will begin to offer us some, some deep insights into patients suffering long after their initial diagnosis of COVID-19. Next slide. Um, I'm also anticipating some significant impacts on the provider community, hospitals, physicians that uh, are going to have some impact on costs. The decline in inpatient and outpatient volume that I already shared with you relative to pre-pandemic levels is cre creating additional pressure on the finances of health systems. Um, and in fact, we've seen in some rural area uh, almost the need to merge with other hospital systems. And, and that's a little bit concerning. Uh, as numerous studies in the U.S. have shown that cost increases in markets where major consolidation of healthcare providers occurred, despite claims made to the contrary prior to the merger. Uh, so what I anticipate is healthcare providers leveraging that decline in utilization and the need to invest in infection control measures during a pandemic with payers resulting in increases in cost. And, and I would anticipate to be a bigger issue in 2022 versus 2021 given the timing of the discussions between payers and providers. So uh, next slide, please. So this is the uh, projection that Morningstar has made. And this is just really one of many possibilities. Uh, the blue bar that you see really uh, suggests what the underlying inflation rate would be uh, in the absence of the pandemic. Uh, the yellow bar, uh, really indicates the impact that the treatment and testing of COVID-19 had on those trends. The green bar shows you the impact of deferred and or recouped services. And obviously in 2020, that had a pretty significant impact. In fact, uh, uh, an impact such that we saw lower costs in 2020 for the first time in my actuarial career, which Trevor was nice enough to say was more than 35 years. Um, the red bar indicates our projection of what we think is going to be the impact of induced demand. Um, the red blotch that you see in 2020 is really the impact of a lot of mental health conditions. But in 2022 and 2023, you're likely to see the impact of, of lack of chronic condition management contributing even more to those issues. And then the mustard colored line that you see there really represents what we think the year over year trend is going to be. Um, we saw, you know, over a 3% decrease in cost in 2022 compared to 2019. But if some of these projections come true and some of the early information we're seeing uh, in May and June of 30% of increases in cost of utilization, at least anecdotally with, with one client that, that have access to that has about 117,000 members, um, uh, you know, 15% increase may not be out of the question. My initial thought was, well, that, that seemed relatively high. But then we may start to see things gravitate a little bit more back to normal, but still higher than, than maybe what we would have might have anticipated our, our normal trend to be. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll turn it back over to Trevor and uh, thank you all for your time. Thanks very much, Ed. Um, it's great to see um, a different perspective. Um, in the UK, of course, uh, nearly all healthcare is handled through the um, public sector. Uh, so we, we're missing out on some of this really important data that you're able to provide. And I'm sure there will be some benefits for the UK actuaries in looking at what's going on in the US. Um, and I hope the reverse is also true that uh, people from the US can uh, uh, see things from a different perspective as well. So with that in mind, let's move on to the next thing, which is the 
Um, what has this and will this mean for financial services, including retirement income, investment and risk, healthcare and ageing? And we've got two speakers um, on this topic. Starting off is Max Rudolph of Rudolph Financial Consulting. Uh, Max is an independent actuary focusing on enterprise risk management <coughs> and asset liability management consulting. His clients have included investment managers and all sizes and types of insurance companies. Max was named a thought leader in ERM, the um, enterprise risk management, within the actuarial profession. He chaired the ERM, ERM symposium and investment section, served on the Society of Actuaries Board of Governors and received a presidential award for leading the uh, certificate in enterprise risk experience practitioner pathway seminars. Um, well, with all of that, it's going to be wonderful to hear from Max and all his experience uh, in his field. So over to you, Max. Well, thank you, Trevor. And, and thank you to the I ILC for, for uh, the invite uh, to bring me back again this year after uh, uh, the interesting conference that we did last year. It's, I'm getting a lot of repeat uh, uh, requests right now. And it, it's interesting because a lot of them are repeats from people who ran across things that I said 15 years ago, uh, coming out of uh, uh, the SARS crisis. Uh, people are saying, you know, when you put slides up back then in 2006, you're talking about supply chain issues and asset issues and mortality and morbidity and food insecurity. And, and you know, that's the same issue that we're dealing with now. And so why why did we not do more proactively uh, to look at that? And, and so, um, Lily, if you go on to the next slide, please. Uh, one more, please. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is, is from the solvency standpoint of the uh, insurance company. Uh, we've seen a lot already uh, from the individual standpoint you know, in terms of health and, and mortality. Uh, and, and what I'm going to do is kind of take a step back and say, well, here's, here's why we did okay uh, this last time. What could change for the next time uh, to, to make it different, either better or, or worse? So first slide here, I'm talking about why, and, and this is specific to the U.S., because we do have things that are, are distinct from, from other countries, mainly you know, what Ed was talking about, the, uh, the fact that we run our, our health care uh, through employment and, and through uh, old age security and, and things like that, as opposed to a single payer system. But the main reason I would argue is that U.S. insurers did, did pretty well, actually, during COVID was, you know, it was only about a week or a week and a half in, and we got this huge stimulus from uh, central banks and, and the U.S. Treasury, you know, guaranteeing some of the, the most risky assets that we had uh, some of the places where uh, insurers had been reaching for yield, uh, those were the same places that, uh, you know, uh, groups like private equity firms that had lots of lobbyists in Washington, they were also reaching for yield in those same places. And so insurers weren't necessarily the ones that were driving the bailout, um, but we were definitely uh, recipients of that. So that could change going forward. We're now you know, the last time I looked, we were over 120% uh, debt to GDP in the U.S., uh, which I think is 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 probably higher than than what I saw earlier from uh, from the U.K. Um, but that's that's going to be an issue going forward. That you know, it's one of those uh, things that works till it doesn't. Um, you know, and, and second, mortality, uh, the fact that it impacted um, old people uh, primarily. Now, again. Every person who dies is, is a tragedy. Uh, but from an insurance company standpoint, if you're already 80 years old, insurance companies have generally put aside reserves because of the premiums that you've paid and, and the investment income that's been earned on those, those earlier revenues. And so the, what we call the net amount at risk, the difference between the face amount that you receive and the amount that we've already set aside in reserves is fairly small. You know, if we had the uh, a similar... Uh, 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 age uh, hit from uh, COVID that we did from the 1918 influenza, uh, where it was more 20 to 40, it'd be a whole different discussion that we'd be having. Um, so 
the the third thing I'll point out, uh, the infrastructure was in place to work from home. Even five years ago, and maybe even less than that, this transition to work from home would have been much, much more difficult. And, and we may not have been able to do it. We may have gone into, I remember in Toronto uh, during the, the SARS crisis, uh, that was one of the cities that was, was impacted outside of, of uh, Hong Kong. And, and what they were doing was, was uh, spreading out the work. Uh, so you had people on the midnight to eight shift and the eight to four shift and the four to midnight shift. So you only had a third of the people and that was the way they were trying to work around that. We would have had to have done something more like that. But because technology has improved by this amount uh, and, you know, we're on a Zoom call right now. I mean, that has had a huge impact on the ability to, to do uh, the work from home strategy. Uh, Ed, Ed talked about deferred health care, so I don't want to spend too much time on that. Um, I, I would point out that um, the one thing that, that's been released just this week in the U.S. is that the, the opioid deaths um, you know, were 30% higher uh, in 2020 than they were in 2019, which is much higher now. I mean, I think everybody expected it to be higher, but I think the, the pure magnitude of that number is, is very sobering for, for everybody. Um, and, and that'll be interesting. Now, from a life insurance standpoint, again, um, somebody who dies from an opioid overdose is probably not the key market that life insurers had. Um, life insurance is very much a, uh, a socioeconomic. You have to be able to pay the premium to have the life insurance. Uh, much of it is, is tied to employment. Um, and, and you have better results uh, as a population at the higher socioeconomic classes. Uh, and then on the, the PNC side, just real briefly, you know, and this is everywhere, you know, we stayed at home. I mean, I had entire months where I didn't fill up my, my tank with gas, uh, you know, with petrol. And, and we're just coming out of that even, even now to where, you know, that caused many of the insurers, the PNC insurers in the U.S. at least, to, to provide either refunds or credits towards the, the next uh, period of coverage. And, and then one I didn't list on here that, that uh, clearly comes up from a PNC standpoint is the uh, business interruption insurance. You know, and not everyone was, was as smart as the Wimbledon folks to, to have a policy that said, if we have a pandemic, you know, you're going to pay me uh, anyhow. Um, so let's, let's go on to the, the next slide. On this one, we had done some work, uh, Jim Tool. Uh, is, a, is a fellow Society of Actuaries, uh, you know, working out of the U.S. And he had done a research project 10 years ago uh, that went through and looked at different uh, pandemics that we'd had in the past and, and essentially built a tool that companies could have used uh, to, um, you know, map out what they thought was happening or as they saw things happening and compare it to past pandemics. So uh, with this, it's a little bit busy slide. The you know, you look at the uh, um, flat line, that's kind of the baseline uh, and all the other lines that represent different <clears throat> pandemics, the, the area under those curves are the same as the area under uh, that blue line uh, that's just flat. And, and so you can see um, you've got the 1918, which is kind of like a W, it's the gray line. Uh, but it had no excess deaths above age 65, very surprisingly. You know, different reasons have been thrown out for that. I think some of them are being uh, stepped back uh, based on the experience of this pandemic. Uh, some people thinking that maybe the 1889 uh, pandemic was actually a coronavirus as opposed to an influenza pandemic. Um, but what you can see is that the, the line that's listed, the, the J curve for COVID-19, that maps pretty well the... Uh, the actual experience that we've had in here in the US, and I think it, it represents um, fairly well what, what the UK has seen as well, that below, below about age 50, you know, there are some folks that are, are passing away, but uh, it's, it's from a statistical standpoint, it's, it's fairly minor that the, the real majority of the, the deaths are happening at the upper ages. So let's go on to the, the next slide. Uh, and here, I'd been thinking about this for a while. And for this presentation, I thought, well, I'm going to actually sit down and, and do this. And I looked at the CDC website here in the US, 
where they they will combine um, influenza and COVID and, and all these types of respiratory diseases uh, into, into one category. And so what I compared was all the data that had been received through December 9th with all the data that had been received through July 7th of, of this year. And, and it's interesting um, that from a chart here, from a graphical representation, there's very little difference. Uh, you can see that the numbers uh, at 85 plus have actually come down a little bit. And so, I mean, and these are set up so that the area under these two curves are the same. So that's made up by other, other places. Um, if you look at a ratio of these two numbers, the big jump is, is actually at the very young ages. Um, I, I saw one, I, I can't remember if it was less than one or zero to four, was like five times as many, but that could be due to influenza coming back a little bit uh, as we go. I know there's been a number of, of uh, newspaper articles recently talking about the increase in uh, uh, colds in, in the U.S. just recently, and we're starting to see respiratory diseases come back. So, so that's kind of interesting that the, the actual distribution of deaths is, is different. And it's, it's not a smooth curve because the data at CDC is, is in 10 year increments and it was different than the 10 year increment. So I was having to average a couple different things together. So it's a, a step curve, but it still gives you a pretty good idea of the shape. Let's, let's go on to the next slide, please, Lily. Um, so for the next time, what, what can we in the US learn from others? I mean, I'm, I'm not in the UK, so I, I can't really speak to, to that, but in the US, there's a lot that we can learn from others. There's a lot that we've fallen within you know, our own politics, within our own bureaucracies, uh, those types of things. Just our, our own um, lack of interest in being proactive in planning for events like this. Um, you know, the second bullet is kind of a red versus blue political, um, trying to be a little bit um, vague in the way I'm saying that, but that's what I'm saying. Uh, <laughs> And, and if the next pandemic is Ebola and people are saying, I'm, I'm unwilling to socially distance, I'm unwilling to do anything like that. Well, if we get something that's, that's not only uh, you know, very highly transmissible, but is very lethal, you know, we're in big trouble. Um, you know, different countries react by culture. I'm actually involved with another paper that uh, uh, Dr. Guntram Werther of, of uh, Temple University is working with on me and it's actually in final edits right now. But one of the things that we asked him to do was to, to look at the look at COVID and, and come up with some examples. And what he did was he looked at four different countries and he looked at the, let's see if I can remember these right, the, the US, Iceland, uh, Japan, uh, oh, and I knew I was gonna forget the, the fourth one. But in any case, each one has a little bit of a, a different uh, culture. And so his point about the US is that, you know, we've got such a high percentage relative to our population of lawyers and we use them, you know, to where you're going to have this delay. And it kind of gets back to my Ebola comment that, uh, you know, we could have a, a much worse situation uh, in the future here in the U S because of that uh, data collection. I am extremely, um, I would love to be in the UK you know, watching the, I've been following the COVID-19 actuaries response group, you know, for the last year. And, and I'm jealous of the data that you have to work with the standardization here in the U S um, you know, we got so bad that people wouldn't trust the CDC. And so people would go to the Johns Hopkins university website or the Washington post, or many of you are probably familiar with our world and data. You know, those are the, the key sources when the key source should be the U.S. government. So the ONS, you know, provides you with uh, a great service by putting the data out quickly that you can you can do analysis of. Now, I'm not saying that the ONS can't do things better. I'm, I'm sure that's uh, very likely as well. Um, but we also here in the U.S. run into these privacy issues. I was working on a research paper uh, last year where we were trying to look at emergency room visits by temperature. Uh, high temperature. And we couldn't get to some of the data because if the data was less than two people in that day, they would they would essentially put it in a zero. Um, so there's all kinds of issues that we should be revisiting like that. The, the safety nets, I think what Europe does with, with uh, um, you know, furloughs uh, is something we should look at. Uh, looking at all the pandemics the last few years, um, 
there's there's a lot of questions, but I, I don't want to take away time from other people. So let's let's move on um, to the next slide. Thank you. The this is my last slide. It's it's a a research project that uh, Dave and and Dan Ingram uh, did for for the SOA, and I was I was involved on the, on the oversight group. But what and and many of you may know Dave. He's been active with the IAA and and other groups in the past, and I and I believe he, he's on this call. Uh, or on this webinar, but um, the couple things I want to point out here is uh, what he was doing was looking at mitigations. And every week, he would send out uh, a poll that it took us about two minutes to to uh, fill out. And it was, "What's your region doing with respect to these mitigations? Are you limiting uh, large gatherings of people? Are you are you um, are people in your region actually wearing their mask?" And, and it was really interesting to track it. And what he found, if, if the numbers on this chart, the correlations are positive, it means it really was uh, after the fact. So the very first one, colleges are closed or holding only remote classes. That was a response to high, high cases, high caseload. It wasn't a driver of low caseload. It was, it was a, a after the fact reaction where the one, the only one that was actually statistically significant is the one at the very bottom, the limit large gatherings of people. And there we didn't, uh, or Dave didn't uh, define what large gatherings was. Each, each person defined it on their own, but it was statistically significant that in regions or areas, um, and we looked at it by state in the US, uh, where large gatherings were, were limited, that made a difference. That helped to reduce the, the future caseload. Uh, so it was it was a little different way of doing research. Uh, it's much like uh, earlier, um, you know, Adrian talked about the response. It wasn't research. This is an attempt to do something like that. It's an attempt to get things out quickly and and be useful. So um, with that, I think that's my my last slide. And so I will turn it back over to Trevor. Thanks uh, ever so much, Max. Uh, lots of interesting ideas and uh, ways in which people can cooperate, which I'm all in favour of. So thank you uh, for provoking thoughts in that area. Finally, um, last but certainly not least, um, Anna Rappaport, uh, who represents the Society of Actuaries Ageing and Retirement Steering Committee in the United States. Uh, she is an actuary, consultant, author, and speaker, and is a nationally and internationally recognized expert on the impact of change on retirement systems and workforce issues. Anna is a past president of the Society of Actuaries and chairs its committee on post-retirement needs and risks and aging and retirement steering committee. Anna is the co-author of several Society of Actuaries reports on COVID-19 and retirement related issues. So who better to talk about uh, retirement and aging than Anna? Please uh, come in, Anna. Uh, thank you. Uh, can we have the next slide, please? Uh, next slide. Uh, Society of Actuaries has done several sets of research on retirement and COVID-19 specifically. There's a series of research papers and we have a list attached to the presentation. There's also a call for essays, and there's a recent survey of financial perspectives by generation that has a large set of COVID-19 uh, questions and how people have responded in it. So I'd like to sort of summarize the very big picture of our findings. We've had uh, two very different sets of results. There are people who are financially hurt and they're those who financially are better off now than they were before the pandemic. So it's very much two worlds versus uh, in there. Minorities are also more affected by COVID-19 by far than uh, the uh, uh, white people. It seems that big differences by racial and ethnic group and part of that's linked to economics, but there's probably more to it than that. Women are more affected by family challenges and also because of their longer lifespans, but more women have left the labor force. Uh, 
there, from my perspective, there's strong reasons to revisit opportunities for older workers and retirement ages and working in retirement. And those are some of the agenda that we failed to address before COVID-19. Uh, there are longer term health effects that are unknown. We've heard a lot about that. Also, there's some longer term economic issues that we don't know. We'd expect, from my perspective, a much greater focus on emergency funds as part of employee benefits. And many jobs are probably likely to be restructured and changed as uh, the job as they change, the compensation and benefits programs are likely to follow. But we there are a lot of again questions there. Next slide, please. If we think about the retirement system issues, I say think about them in two buckets. There are new challenges because of COVID-19. And some of those were that short term, but some of them are more will also be going forward and we're not out of the woods yet. And then if we go back to 2019, there were a lot of issues in the uh, retirement system pre-COVID and those haven't gone away. So what we basically have is what we had before and a new layer on top of it. The new challenges included a lot of job loss layoffs, reduced work schedules. Uh, there, a lot of the people are back to work, but there's still people that have had job problems. And um, there are a lot of job issues, even though people are trying to hire and can't get people. Uh, as been mentioned before, the longer term health issues, women leaving the labor force. Uh, there was government assistance, but many small businesses went out of business or shrank. Restaurants are an example of businesses that frequently went under. Uh, people wanted to retire differently as a result of the pandemic, about a third in our survey. And retirement funds could be used early for COVID-19. That didn't happen too much. Uh, and while there was concern about people not saving, that didn't happen at all. The challenges in 2019 before COVID included problems in social security, a lot more risk having been shifted to the individual, a shift to DC, uh, lower benefits for racial and ethnic minorities, not because of a different system, but because of the economic differences primarily um, and differences in job history um, and big decline in risk taking. So there's a lot of issues that we need to deal with going forward. Next slide, please. Uh, this leads us to a big list of policy and societal questions relating to retirement plans. I won't go through all of these, but I'll just mention a couple for us to think about as we go forward, happy to answer questions about them. And the US, we haven't studied national retirement policy in a broad way uh, for years and years and years. So will aging society and national retirement policy become a priority? And will we deal with the way longevity is changing? I think that's very important with these unsolved social security issues. Uh, the employer sponsored health system was mentioned. Only about half the workers in the US right now have access to an employer sponsored retirement plan. So will policymakers seek to encourage more employer sponsored plans or less? Will there be mandates? Uh, will they seek to improve opportunities for older workers? And what will happen if jobs are restructured? Uh, and their new models of employment, what will that do to benefits? Uh, then two more big questions, the access, people that didn't have access to employer plans, will there be state sponsored plans and they've started to grow in many states, will they really take hold? Or what will happen for those people? And lastly, we had big defined contribution improvement legislation called the SECURE Act in 2019. Nothing really happened to implement that or not very much because of the pandemic. So will the types of pooled employer plans established take off or not what will happen in that direction? Uh, next slide, please. 
Uh, so our survey on COVID, uh, survey, the COVID-19 findings in the generation survey, uh, the uneven impact of the pandemic was the top finding for me. 36% uh, of the respondents, and this was just a couple of months ago, said the COVID-19 pandemic negatively affected their financial situation, while 14% said that it had improved their financial situation. Uh, the job disruption was most common to millennials, with four out of 10 experiencing job loss or a pay decrease. And that was true for 33% of Gen Xers and 21% of the late boomers. Uh, and then the other generations are already retired mostly. A third of workers said they were changing when they expected to retire with most of them saying they would retire later, but some retiring earlier. Uh, we also, what surfaced in the survey is that millennials are the most concerned about climate change impacting their retirement. And overall, the people that were most concerned about retirement risks, kind of a surprise was the uh, younger age groups. Next slide. Uh, so we mentioned the overall financial impact and we had a similar pattern for income, level of debt, not as many people, only 23% negatively impacted and the same kind of thing for asset level. So overall, we had this mixed impact on all sorts of financial measures. The next slide, please. Uh, so as we're moving forward, I said, we have these big societal questions. We have much more specific questions about the retirement system and thinking about, should it change? I'm gonna give an overall comment to this. I'd say we're very divided within the US between people who are at the extreme of saying we should basically have an entirely different system, start over. Half the people don't have coverage under the employer system. It's not working well, but that's not where the mainstream is, where the, where the political discussion in Congress is all about improving the defined contribution system. There's more legislation that's been proposed for another round of little pieces of improvement. So we have the SECURE Act in 2019, Secure, the SECURE II is being proposed now, and it's all about the defined contribution system. And the defined contribution system works very well for people who have stable long-term jobs and who put a lot of money into the plan. If you get, save well and don't take the money out early, it's the system saves money. But for people that don't have stable employment or who are not participating, it, they're left out. And it also leaves a lot of risk on employees. But I don't see a major shift away from that right away. But there's definitely different perspectives. Big question for me is there too much risk placed on the employee and who should bear those risks? We also need changes to Social Security and Medicare to keep them in financial balance. And that's also one way to potentially deal with the people without coverage. Uh, Medicaid, which is the last resort medical system, it has financial issues. Uh, employers in the shorter term are likely to focus on emergency funds. And um, the, whether they'll focus on the aging population, we don't know. I think it's so critical that we do more to focus on risk and not so much risk on employees and give them better options. Uh, also interesting question with employees wanting to defer retirement, what opportunities will they get? We've also had the question of how many people would leave work because of fear of getting sick. And I heard at in the last two days about returning to work, people who were like, we don't really want to return to work unless everyone's vaccinated or we don't want to work with people side by side who weren't vaccinated. I'm also hoping for more interest in phased retirement. Uh, the next slide, please. So I mentioned that we had uh, three sets of society actuar of actuaries research. 
this financial perspectives on aging and retirement across the generations. There's a lot of COVID-19 content that's available on the website. The, the main report, more reports are coming, the specialized reports. Then we've had six retirement related reports on COVID-19 and a series of essays. The next slide. Uh, so this is just a list of our resources in terms of the uh, of these reports, they're all available. They cover retirement risks, uh, senior housing and support choices, working in retirement, uh, defined contribution, defined benefit plans, and the family. And then the last slide, uh, this is our list of our essays. So um, a lot there, I'd be happy to hear from any of you and answer questions. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. And I was finding myself thinking there's so much here that, I, that rings bells in the UK as well, in, at least in terms of the big picture. Uh, so many of the issues seem similar and the um, profession has been having a big initiative on this whole question of risk transfer. I don't know if any of our participants is able to comment on that. Well, we've reached the um, end of the formal presentation and move into the question and answers for which we've got uh, just under a quarter of an hour. Um, looking at the questions received so far, um, there's quite a bit um, on long COVID. So I think what I'd like to do is um, uh, maybe see who is able to just give a bit more views on long COVID and what they're looking out for to see if it's going to be significant. Uh, particularly if it does become endemic. Um, maybe if, uh, let me just see, if anyone wishes to put their hands up um, or just uh, get started in commenting on long, long COVID, if you can just uh, get started, please. Yeah, I'll, uh, this is Ed Duplosky. I'll, I'll, I'll make maybe a quick comment. There's uh, really the causing condition of, of long COVID really remains unknown today. Uh, and there are several studies that are being conducted to really uh, better understand the long-term effects. There are, at this point, I think just several theories out there from a healthcare perspective that uh, include uh, persistent immune activation after the acute phase uh, of, the, uh, of the virus, uh, potentially some initial damage from the virus, such as, as damage to the nerve pathways. Um, and those are typically slow to heal, uh, and that might be the result of it. Uh, and then persistent presence of maybe a low level uh, of, of the virus itself. So at this point in time, there's, there's still, uh, I think, a lot of investigation to go, try to understand some of the, the neurological impacts. But, um, you know, the impact, I think, on healthcare costs, I still think, remains a lot to be seen. And, and we still need to just pay attention to the studies to understand better. Uh, what, what's the result of, of the impact of long COVID? Uh, thanks, Ed. Anna, you wanted to say something. Uh, yes, I did. Uh, I'm particularly concerned in thinking about it also that one of the issues we haven't done a good job on in the U.S. is disability benefits. And I see real questions with long COVID about what's gonna be the impact on disability benefits, how many people aren't gonna have coverage, is there gonna be some pressure to change the definition of disability because it, uh, some of these situations may be fuzzy. People, they're not as good as they were before, but they're not terribly, they're not totally disabled or what is totally disabled. So I think there's, there's a whole set of benefit issues that we aren't even talking about and we don't know, but really need watching. And I think with that watching, we need to say again, does the system work well for disability? Uh, and I also think we have, when we think about older people working, I also think a lot of long haulers in that effect, people that might've done just fine, they're, they're, not, they're not gonna do quite as fine. Okay, anybody else want to chip in? Uh, Matt, you wanted to say something. 
Yes, thanks, Trevor. I, I think I agree with what the other two speakers have said there, and there is a lot of uncertainty there. I, I was going to flag, there is a, a preprint paper out from Chris Martin and, and some others providing a framework to try and um, project prevalence and impact of long COVID in the UK. Um, and that, that, that paper's sort of pulled together a, a model approach that can use the kind of data we've already got to give some indications of, of what might be happening uh, and what we, might, we, might we see going forwards. Um, I think one of the big challenges is we still don't really have good intelligence about how that, the vaccination programs are affecting the, the prevalence and um, likely longer term impacts um, going forwards. And we don't have a long enough history of those people who pre-vaccination have, have still got symptoms and how long they will last and how long they will run for. I think there is, though, a, a couple of groups with subsets within those that have long COVID. And, and some of these are linked to those that had very, very serious cases and had mechanical ventilation, et cetera, where... I think there probably is some slightly better understanding of the issues they've suffered and longer term consequences. But it's it's that other group that haven't necessarily had such severe medical interventions and it's difficult to know what the drivers are and what the long term impacts will be. So it will be something that needs um, continual assessment and that from a government perspective that obviously has real implications for, for the demand on health services going forward uh, and the, the, the relative costs of those and, and where that funding comes from. Okay, thank you very much. Um, looking at the questions and answers, I'll just take one more question, which was, um, what is the future of annuities? And that, that can bring in Caroline and maybe uh, Anna or somebody from the US just to comment on where things stand at the moment and what you see as the future. Caroline, do you want to go first? Yeah, sure. I mean, as I said in, in my presentation, um, life expectancy is still increasing. And, and I like to think, I mean, people are quite happy to take out an insurance product, a term insurance product against the risk of them dying. I sometimes think an annuity could be almost, it, it, um, it's almost the opposite. It's something taken out the risk of you living because it provides you with an income for, for the rest of your lifetime. So um, I think annuities still do have a place personally. Um, and I think it is just, but I think um, it perhaps needs to be considered as part of a raft of different um, financial options. They may not be suitable for everybody, um, but, uh, but I think it is, uh, there, is, there is still a future for annuities. Um, and I think that's just something which perhaps life insurance companies just need to just make sure that um, they're, off, they're offering um, a range of alternatives of which I think annuities will always be one of them. So you're not seeing any major uh, change, any step change in uh, sales or anything like that? Not, not as, certainly not as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. I mean, yes, we, uh, we, we saw a step change as a result of pensions freedom, which, which allows people to, um, to now not take an annuity once their, um, their pension policy comes to retirement age. So we did see a, quite a step change at that point. Um, and that it was probably right for, for some people. Um, if you've built up quite a small fund, um, then if it only provides you an annuity of, of five pound a month, then you probably would be thinking, oh, actually, let's just have the cash now. But um, we, the annuity market, it, it is still, it is still um, strong. So there are still annuities being bought. Um, and I say it is still the right solution for some people, which is why it's important to take financial advice. Anna. Because the US market is a bit different to the UK on annuities, yeah. if I remember correctly. Right. And I'm, I should say I'm, I've been working in uh, private pensions for years, but not specifically in the insurance market. But I think I can offer some perspective. There's a huge issue which has been going on for the last two, three, four years and uh, is not going away, but not reaching resolution at all with the defined contribution plans as to what sort of payout options they should offer and to get more people to do some sort of systematic payout, be it an annuity or something else after retirement. 
uh, there's a huge problem that many people uh, don't do long-term planning and aren't thinking long-term, but also social security income in the United States is pretty much all of the annuity income that a lot of people have, it, but some people are actually living on it. And if you look at the assets of retirees, there are many of them that come into retirement where their major asset is in their house and they don't have many financial assets. For those people, there's not really much annuity issue. Um, there, and the US annuity market, there's several different markets. There, there are uh, annuities that are bought while people are still working that aren't really payout annuities. There are investment products from insurance companies in variable annuity contracts. They may or may not get a payout annuity, uh, but they're um, payout annuities. There's a big need for them right now with the interest rates so low. Uh, people who were really using them quite a lot a few years ago are, um, they're like, it's not a good time to buy annuities and uh, the market is struggling with payout annuity market. I think there's a need for it to uh, be strengthened. I think it, we need to see what's gonna happen with the interest rates. The interest rates from my perspective are so low because of government policy, not because of the market, the, the operation of the market alone. Uh, so that's a, that's a question there. So uh, maybe COVID will improve uh, and this is one of the things we're going to explore in another study. Will the COVID experience cause people to do more longer term planning? Think more about the longer term. Uh, we don't know. But right now, I'd say there's a lot of uncertainty about what payout options, but there's going to be more focus on payout options in the next few years. Thank you very much, Anna. I think we're coming to a close, so I want to ask um, a final question for all the panelists, uh, which goes like this. And I think I'll start with uh, Douglas, then Adrian, because uh, we haven't given them a chance in this session so far, which is, what are you keeping your eye on over the coming year? What are you, what are you looking out for? Because it may affect what you do, both positively and negatively. So. That's the question. What are you keeping your eye on for the next year? And I shall start with Douglas. Oh, a great question, Trevor. Um, for me, I'm keeping an eye on the corporate property market. Uh, I would love to see how it res how people respond to going back to work in particularly in central London and, and in New York and seeing whether we have a permanent behavioral change towards commuting to the office. I think if we do that will that will really influence the shape of longevity improvements in the future. Thank you. Uh, if I can ask everyone to uh, be like Douglas and uh, just keep uh, to a sentence or so. Uh, Adrian. Um, there's two things which I think are counterbalancing. On the one hand I keep an eye on whether this virus starts to mutate in that it starts of course, some more acute illnesses. But at the other side, I'm also keeping an eye on the implications of the novel development of the vaccines, particularly the mRNA type vaccine, which could have very significant implications for a whole range of diseases. And if those two, those two could kind of balance each other, but they could also both go pear shaped. <laughs> yes, fascinating, because there is talk about uh, cancer improvements as a result of the research, isn't there? Um, Caroline, can I ask you to go next? Yeah, so I mean, as I said, um, our risk is people living, um, li it costs money if people live longer, so we need to be prepared for that. So I'm just looking for any um, catalysts um, that might happen. So I think the, um, our, um, the mRNA vaccine is one of them. So what catalysts as a result of this pandemic? So the actual, good, what good news has come out of this? And I think um, vaccine uptake could be one. Um, people's um, understanding about the um, obesity, because obviously we, we saw a lot of um, um, obesity was a risk factor. So anything that might change behaviours that actually has a, a positive impact going forward. Thank you. Max? Yeah, I'm maybe to follow on on what Anna was saying earlier. Um, I'm looking at the, the number of insurance companies that are, are being bought and owned now by asset managers. 
to where they feel that's the side of the balance sheet that they're going to make their money on and uh, the ability for them to, to reach for yield in a uh, low interest rate environment. And as, as some of those asset classes potentially blow up and we have a concentration of, of, of risk within specific insurance companies, and then the, the impact of climate on top of that. <laughs> I'm glad to see that. Uh, Ed? Yeah, just really the impact of how care will be provided in the U.S. You know, we saw significant changes in how individuals with uh, severe COVID were treated initially, and, and we saw a decline in the number of deaths. Uh, going forward, you know, how is telemedicine going to have a uh, uh, play in healthcare, given that that uh, became much more prominent than it was pre-COVID? So, so I think how care changes is really what I'm keeping my eye on. Thank you. Anna? Uh, job restructure and whether it's going to lead to people rethinking how they provide retirement benefits, uh, when they retire and how they retire. And finally, Matt. Uh, thanks, Trevor. I, I think for me, it's uh, vaccine, vaccine persistence and the, the length of time that that will provide cover and whether we see re-emergence of uh, waves in the future. And combined with that, uh, from an economic perspective, uh, where inflation is going and all the drivers that, that feed through that. Excellent. Well, thank you, everyone. I think we've had a actually what a wonderful top seven list of things to look out for. So thank you all. Um, but more generally, thank you for your um, excellent uh, presentations um, and participation. Uh, to those who are on this seminar, we hope you can also join us uh, for our upcoming events over the next few weeks. We have just launched ticket sales for our seventh annual Future of Aging conference on the 2nd of December. This year's theme is on diversity uh, and how we can make aging work for everyone. Uh, for, for, to find out more, it should be uh, on the uh, slides or in the pack that you can get access to. Uh, for news on ILC's latest webinars and to stay up to date with all the ILC news, please visit our website at ilcuk.org.uk, join our mailing list and follow us on Facebook and Twitter at, at ILCUK and subscribe to our YouTube channel for all our newest webinars and videos. And to finish, uh, we hope to welcome you at another webinar or event in the very near future. Thank you. Have a good day. Goodbye. Bye, everybody.